Wow, that's the start, Sophia. So before this interview, we did two minutes meditation. It was very nice. <laughs> and at the end of the meditation was was brilliant because Sophia set her timer on her on her phone and I'm wearing headsets. So I was floating away and then all of a sudden there was this loud beep that brought me back into Zoom and the recording and the video. Hi, Sophia. How are you today? Good morning. I'm fine, even though, you know, like our meditation didn't work. And I feel happy to be here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you for interviewing you. We've, we've met a few weeks ago. Um, you live in Amsterdam. You're from Portugal. You're now on holiday in Portugal. Um, so interesting. We spoke about the Rietveld Academy. Um, arts, filmmaking, and you just said something so interesting just now. You said to me, creating a movie, making a film is like doing your PhD. Can you, can you explain that to me? Because I think that's, that's a very interesting sentence. Yeah. Uh, well, um, I did study filmmaking a few years ago and First, before studying filmmaking, I was studying graphic design. That was my first uh, degree that I, I did in Portugal. And uh, halfway my graphic design degree, I, I, was, I started to be very passionate about cinema because I had a, a beautiful, amazing semiotics teacher uh, that took me into that path. And then I started to think that I really wanted to make movies but I was doing graphic design. And how could I combine that? <clears throat> so at the end of my, uh, my degree, I, I did make a movie instead of um, a graphic design, a website, whatever they wanted me to do. So I said, I'm going to make a movie. I'm not going to write a thesis about graphic design. Um, and they said, okay, let's see how that works. Um, and then I did make a movie, a documentary about uh, blindness, because I was very interested in how people that don't see, because I was so visual, you know, I was studying graphic design and everything, images was, were and still are a very important uh, uh, part of how I know the world and how I even know people. Yeah. So I was interested how blind people would do that. Um, and I went through this process, I think I was three months with a, a blind person and I did well, I just wanted to learn how they see and I learned a lot. I learned so much in those three months about something that I had no idea about, another world. Um, and Can you that, give an example? Can you share for, something? With yeah, for example, so this person was not blind from birth because I wanted someone that was not blind from birth and, and because I thought the experience would be completely different. Uh, but he did acquire some of the, let's say, superpowers of uh, super senses of the, of the ones that are uh, born blind. So one of the things that I learned, for example, is that blind people, he was not able to do that, uh, but blind people from birth, they can uh, see color. They know, they can learn the colors because every color has an energy, has a, a, a warmth in it. Um, even with different fabrics, right? So different fabrics. There are fabrics that are more difficult, but if you have like cotton and you have, if you have three colors, they will touch the cotton uh, and, and they will know which color it is because that's how they learn. They learn the, the warmth, the energy of the color while we learn the visual right? We learn that red is red because it's red, because we see it. But yeah. they learn the color red by touching it and feeling the energy and the warmth of the color. Wow. I yeah. didn't know that. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. So, so I've learned so much with this one person and which also with research and, and, and you know, so that's when you told me about doing a PhD or making a movie and what would serve best uh, um, your quest 
uh, to know what is a nonlinear brain in a multi-potential life. I, I said that because I remember, I remember that making a movie, you learn so much and you're so um, inside a subject for that, you know, sometimes it's three months for me, but sometimes it's years. People take years, so 10 years making a movie. Um, so why is a PhD a, a theoretical um, a paper um, more insightful or more powerful or, you know, bringing more knowledge to the world than, than a movie? So that's my comment uh, came from that. Yeah. Interesting, because there's a lot to say about storytelling, right? And, and it's creating a movie is storytelling. Um, but also being blind and touching color is storytelling, maybe as well to yourself by feeling the energy and translating the energy into a story which is red because they've never seen red, but it feels like something particular that visual people call it red, although they've never seen the color red themselves. So. Because it's, we don't see with our eyes, but we don't. We see with our brain. Exactly. And, and that's fascinating. And that's what we spoke about the first time we spoke with each other. It's, it's storytelling, right? It's, it's what, what kind of stories do we tell ourselves and what kind of communication do we have in our own system, in our own brain? Can you, um, can you explain to me how you got there. So you started doing your uh, education in, in, in design, then you went into filmmaking because you thought that was very interesting. And I, uh, you told me you had a very interesting career in filmmaking and with the festival in, in Portugal. And, and, and here you are now in Amsterdam and you're doing, what is it? Nonviolent communication training and and it all relates to each other. I always say to people that when you are a multi-potentialite, you're doing so many different things, but you're not doing different things. You're, all, you're doing the same thing and it always comes together. Can you share your path a little bit with us on, yeah. on what happens with all the things that came together where you are right now yeah. on holiday in Portugal? <laughs> well, yeah. Let's, let me see. It's, it's like going back through all my life, obviously, um, to all the things that I've done. But uh, by studying uh, nonviolent communication, which is a communication model, uh, it's the toolkit uh, that brings you, I think, a bit closer to yourself and to others, you know, because the words are very important also. Mm -hmm. um, I've been learning that uh, people uh, are my main concern. And that's what I've been um, searching or working with uh, all my life. Um, so I'm very passionate about knowing what is going on in the other. I'm very aware of other people's needs. I'm very, I'm very observant. So that helps me, for example, with filmmaking, the observation. Uh, and it's funny that uh, when you learn nonviolent communication, the first step is to learn how to observe without evaluation, you know, observe like a film camera, you know, how to see observe things. Observe without evaluation. Does that mean observe without judgment? Yes. Is that the same thing? Yeah. Yeah. What we all do, right? Constantly. We're so judgmental, all of us. Exactly. So, you know, that was the first thing that I thought it was uh, interesting because I was like, okay, I have to actually see the world with a camera, you know, yeah. to, be, to be able to connect with people. And that's what I did before, before I wanted to know about people. So I used the camera, but then you use a camera and you go to the editing room and you create your own story. So yeah. there is your interpretation, you know what the camera registers its observation, but then you put your story into other people's stories. So yeah. what do you tell? And then I started working with, um, I started photographing and making a lot of videos that had no people on them, 
So I was very interested in spaces, in architecture, in emptiness. And then I was wondering why, you know, why did, did I go on this path where I leave people behind? Because yeah, because I, you just said people are your main concern. It was all yeah. about people. And then... But there was thought, a part oh. of my life, and it was the part of my life where I traveled a lot by myself, and I was mm -hmm. by myself a lot, that I tried to concentrate on myself. So to know myself. So that was a journey for me. And in that journey, I started photographing uh, architecture because I thought I'm going to concentrate on myself. I want to know myself. So I cannot have people around me. I cannot observe people in my work because that will take me away from myself. Uh, that I want to know so much and I want to be in contact with. So that was my strategy at that time, was, was to do that. Um, that didn't work <laughs> in a way that I wanted. You know, I didn't become the artist that I wanted to be or the filmmaker. Okay, so you wanted to be an artist. The, the, was your dream to create documentaries and get acknowledgement all over the world for beautiful documentaries or what, what what was your aim i, I wanted to make movies that uh change people's lives that's mm -hmm. what i wanted to do i wanted to show things that were different and they were um, uh, creative and they were uh, unknown so like the the blindness you know like like yeah. something that is it is here in the world it is around us but we don't see it we yeah. don't um, then I started doing a project on deaf people also, um, but then I, I didn't finish it because I entered the Rietveld and in the Rietveld Academy I was not allowed to make documentaries, it was more artistic uh, uh, school that would like you to do smaller projects that uh, wouldn't take so long. Uh, for example, something very interesting about deaf people, deaf children, Mm -hmm. is that they learn how to lie much or deceive much later because <laughs> uh, lying implies a certain um, vibration in your voice and also in your heart beat when you're lying mm -hmm. so when a child uh, a child that is not a hearing child will learn very fast to, for example, hit something uh, under their back because they want to say, oh, I was not doing anything, you know, and they have like, I don't know, something that they cannot have in their hand. Uh, uh, um, uh, a deaf child uh, does not to do that because they don't hear, so they don't understand the scene. They don't understand what, uh, when a person would, say something that is not true uh, you know so it's it's just another curiosity <laughs> that i had no idea about uh, that line is it, is it also because the i'm thinking quickly about my own children and when they took a candy without asking and you say did you take that the question itself did you take a candy is a different question if if you suspect them of lying or going to lie because you're you're asking it with a different tone of voice already. So is is that also where it's that where it's that, it's also it's, it's all about the intonation and the vibration. So so yeah. all of those things are learned much faster if you hear. So if you don't hear, uh, you know, it's it's only the face or the lips. Obviously, you have several face exp facial expressions. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. But wow. the, 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 the phenomenon of lying, uh, 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 it's not only the intonation, but it's also the vibration and your heartbeat. And that's something, uh, yeah, that deaf people cannot, um, yeah. What, what happens, why, so going to the Rietveld is, is, would you say going to the Arts Academy is one of the big reasons why your documentaries 
were not there or or you didn't make any more documentaries because if I'm listening to you right now, I think a lot of people who are listening right now are thinking, I would have loved to see these documentaries. Why didn't she do that? Mm, I cannot know exactly why I didn't do it. I don't know if it was uh, uh, going to the art school. It was just how life uh, unfolded. It's it's just how it went. Yeah. That must, you know. Do you regret great. that? Do you regret the fact that you never made these documentaries? Um, I mourn is more the word than regret. I mourn that at that time I chose different strategies to get what I wanted. Yeah. Yeah. So I mourn the strategies. But regret would you would you if you would be able to go back, would you do it differently? Uh probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Probably I would have done something uh different. Yes. Yes. Would you would you have gone to the Rietveld Academy, which is a very good academy, which is a beautiful no, it's, arts it's, academy. It's one of the best in the Netherlands. But would you, if if in re, in re, a retrospective, looking at this, would you take the same decisions again? It's just, which is a stupid question, of course, because it's you know it does make, but it's it's fascinating to know if you look back at these things and back at time like that question what would you say to your uh, you know 20 years old self you know yeah what would you say now i would say be more aware yeah uh, i would say be more connected to yourself uh, something that i only am learning now at 42 um were, were you trying to um to fit in, in the norm, to be accepted? Not at all. I was not. Not at all. Not, not at all. I just wanted to do whatever came my way, I, and I actually was uh, trying to go the opposite way of the norm. <laughs> Everything that was the norm for me was something to be avoided. Yeah, it was not good anyway. <laughs> so, no. so I would I, even the Rietveld, which is a very um, let's say avant-garde school and open, you know, when I was there, I was um, um, questioning everything, you know. I, and now, and, and when, you, when you look at yourself right now here. I, I do, I question everything all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. want to know everything. I, I, I don't know anything, but you know, if you look at my bookshelf, there's books about everything. So I am curious about everything. Uh, I think that all stories have a beautiful um, um, advantage to your life. You know, everything you learn, uh, you can use it. Uh, Every so angle is, is is special, even the angles we don't we don't yeah. see. Right? It's yeah, exactly. Everything is interesting. Exactly. But, and but how do you do that with your children? Because you have how many children do you have? Two. I have two children, four and nine. Yeah, yeah. How does it work for you with your four and nine-year-olds? Well, having children is really a mirror. Huh? You, you are in front of a mirror every day. Uh, so that's very confronting. It's super exciting. Uh, mm -hmm. It really brings you back to yourself in a way to, to, to raise two, two small human beings and seeing them grow. And then you see that they're growing um, yeah, mirroring what you're doing, mirroring what you are, and trying to find their own way of, 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 of growing and their personalities. Um, so for me, it has been one of the best things in my life, yeah, to, to, to be a mother. Are, are they also going against the norm already at the age of four and nine? If they're going against the norm, I don't know if they're going, I, 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 I try to teach them that, to always question everything. <laughs> uh, you know, like, um, why do you do it like this? Well, you know, it can be another way and, and for them to understand what's, you know, what's the best for them. Uh, yeah. it, it's difficult not to um, talk about storytelling again. Um, it's, it's, it's very hard. Uh, not to tell your story, you know, to your children and, and give them your point of views and let them be open uh, also to 
to respect. I think that's what I've learned the most is to respect and to trust that a four-year-old and a nine-year-old has so much to teach me as I have to teach them. Um, yeah. So, so, so that exchange, uh, if you believe uh, in them and you trust in these small human beings, then, then, then I think you can learn a lot. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I think people, people uh, are the main focus um, of my work. And even as a director of the film festival, which I did uh, after you know many years doing very different things. Um, I created my film festival and I did it why? Because I love to connect people with each other. I love to connect different disciplines. I always thought cinema and architecture were very, um, and that's my festival, an architecture film festival. And architecture uh, and cinema are very interconnected in terms of uh, not only what's on the screen and what is being built. Um, if we look at the history of our architecture and the history of film, they're very interconnected, the movements, um, the stories, the, yeah, it, it tells you the stories of the world, right? If you watch cinema. How do you, I agree, but how do you as a professional, as someone who is as you are, when you look at a documentary, what happens? That's what I wanted to ask. So, um, I'm guessing a lot of things happen when you look at a documentary of how it's been made, what do you see, what's the story, and everything else. What happens with you when you watch a documentary? I think it's like uh, when an architect goes to any house, you just see the details, you try to put everything apart and then together again, and, and you notice what's, what touches you, uh, you're more sensitive. I think yeah. that's, that's the word. You're more sensitive uh, because, because you're passionate about it and you know a lot about it. Um, sometimes it can even be a bit of a burden, right? Because you're not really watching it in a total freedom. You're, you know, having all these stories in your head. Oh, why is this camera like this? Or, 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 or you know, like, Sometimes I even see like, okay, they, they just changed the shots and, you know, the hand is not in the same place yeah. <laughs> as the shot before. So, so sometimes it can even kind of impair a bit your experience. But uh, if it is a good documentary, then you forget all of this. And, and, and you really enjoy it. And when it's a documentary where a lot of details are not on the right place, so to speak, then you can get a little bit annoyed. Then you get annoyed, yeah. So when it's well done, when, <laughs> when it's well done, um, you probably are immersed in the story because yeah. that's what any film does. You, you have a protagonist, a character, or that it can be anything. And then you start being, well, a good documentary depends on the person who is seeing it, but a good documentary, I think, is, is something that it's, that a story that is universal. So a story that you can rely and you can actually see yourself, you know, like the character becomes, or the story becomes a bit of like your avatar. So you're like, you're feeling what they're feeling. You're, you know, more in fiction that happens, but that happens also in documentaries where, where if you empathize, if you can see yourself in the character uh, or in the story, um, yeah, that will touch you more, of course. Yeah. Yeah, it, when you can relate to an, a story, you can feel it better. You can see the colors. I keep I keep coming back at the example of of blind people seeing colors by feeling the energy, and and I think that's very interesting. And I think that's what you want to achieve with the documentary as well, is to share that energy that you're filming, so you can yeah. feel the things that you can see. Exactly. For example, with that particular documentary, which was my only documentary that I that I that I did in my life, um, uh, I gave a, a film camera, uh, one of those um, um, throwaway cameras, you know, for yeah. yeah, disposable cameras. So I gave him that camera and I said, "Hey, can you take pictures of things you see uh, in the house?" 
in your house or whatever because he, he didn't move much he was at work or, or home and then he took pictures of things that he saw with other senses for example he would take a photo of the pan and he would say hey i know what's my dinner what's for dinner my mom is making fish with potatoes because i can smell it you know, uh, you would take a photo of the clothes, of the laundry outside in the sun, and then you would say in this photo. So he took the photos for me, and then when I saw the photos, I was like, "Oh my god!" And then he would, you would tell me what was on the photo, so I could see the photo, but he was the so one. So cool. And then I gave him a second camera, and I said, "Just continue to do what you're doing, uh, taking photos of, of things you see." And then something happened. He was not tell, uh, taking photos anymore to what he was seeing. He was taking yeah. photos of memories. So he was telling me a story. So he was taking a photo of a bench that that's where he and his girlfriend, his first girlfriend, sat and kissed. And kissed. He was taking a photo of a house that was the house where he grew up. So in the second camera, he decided, not me, that he wanted to tell a story. He wanted to wow. tell a story. Uh, so this is, I think, the power of, of trusting, you know, trusting the character or trusting your children or trusting other people. You, we all have different stories. And what do these stories do to us? It's only our responsibility. It's nobody it's else. Responsibility. So if you ask me, do you regret? Do you think it was because you went to the Rietveld that you didn't do documentaries? No. It was me. I, yeah. am, I, am, I am radically self-responsible for everything that happened in my life. Even though I could have stimulus from other people and mm -hmm. from other situations, I am the only one uh, uh, that chose. I'm the one choosing story yeah yeah and and this is also what you're doing right now with the communication and 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 telling stories not well, judging really listening and really feeling and and yeah. not just listen to the sentence but listen to everything that's yeah. why nonviolent communication is so important in my life right now because i had to unlearn to uh, to make stories in my head, yeah? And I have to understand how to uh, observe as a film camera, you know, N not have any moral judgments about what I think or about what other people tell me, you know? And then this uh, communication model also helps me connect to, okay, if I saw that particular thing happening or something, somebody said this to me and I made a story in my head, why did I do that? Where does that come from? You know, so I felt annoyed because somebody said something, right? I felt annoyed because, you know, why? What do I want at that particular moment, you know, that I don't get? And that's why I get annoyed, you know? Yeah. Maybe at that moment, that person is saying too many words that I enjoy, you know? Maybe I just feel like being restful and relaxed and now I have to, you know, hear this person talk for two hours. And then I understand that it's not that this person is annoying, which is the moral judgment, you know, the interpretation. It's just me that I don't want to hear this person right now. I feel, yeah. you know, that I need to relax. So then what can I do, you know? What can I do to myself? What can I request from this person or from myself that makes my life better? You yeah. know, so, so, so it's a disconstruction of all the things that I've learned in my life and we learn, which is to blame and to, to, to uh, attack other people for what we are feeling yeah. and not being really responsible. So I think that so it, it's so amazing and transformative to do this shift of empathizing with yourself and with the other. And what can that do also in terms, I am very interested now that we're talking about storytelling about artificial intelligence. So, so my, my, my also one of my, my interests at the moment is to know how the brain works and how the, the brain works in itself, like physically, biologically, and how can 
you know, I interact with the with artificial intelligence because that's the power, right, of the human being. Yeah. To yeah. collaborate and empathize and to have emotions. And obviously that's been studied for many years now. How can they apply that to artificial intelligence? Uh, and for me, I, I think it's amazing. How can we create in the future a world where machines can also teach us how to uh, communicate better with ourselves? And uh, because it's very difficult for us to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm... Yeah, and, and computers don't have any trauma, hopefully. Uh, that makes a big difference, right? Yeah. So we have all our trauma in our system, in our brains, in our feeling, in our hearts, emotion, blood streams everywhere. Yeah. That immediately has an impact in all the things we feel and, and we hear and, and we sense and, and That's whatnot. That's where the stories come from. So actually right? trauma can be also something, you know, that you can see as something positive, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You are aware that the trauma is there. If you are aware that that uh, that's how stories are built. They're built because we lived through something, right? Um, so you can use the word trauma, which is quite negative, you know, when we hear trauma, it's like, oh, trauma, you know, but trauma. Oh God, something trauma, horrible. Yeah. Trauma can be anything, you know, yeah. trauma can be a, a rape, but it also can be someone not listening to you. Yeah. Uh, so it can be something very simple. Um, there's a, a beautiful um, uh, book. Well, there's many books, but I, I do love uh, Gabor Mate, which is a physician. Uh, a film just came out a month ago. Did you see it? Did you see his documentary about yeah, trauma? Yeah, I've seen it and I've seen all the talks uh, that were uh, in that week. Uh, oh, that now I'm very curious. Um, what do you think about his documentary? Um, what's it called? It, it, yeah, it the was released. The Wisdom of Trauma. The wisdom. Yeah, it was released a month ago or something, yeah. right? Early June. Yeah. What do you think? Be honest about the, this documentary. It's, uh, as I said before, it's a documentary that can only uh, touch you because it's about a subject that touches us all, the whole yeah. humanity. Um, so I think it would be very difficult to make a bad documentary. <laughs> With such a, with such a universal, uh, uh, with such a universal uh, theme, trauma. But I do think it's well made. It's well filmed. Uh, uh, they did concentrate the documentary on him. You know, uh, uh, I I would say that maybe trauma is the character, uh, but he also plays a big role uh, in, in in the documentary. Uh, yeah, the documentary is about him and, and about his work, but yeah. his work is so insightful and he's, he shows, uh, I think that the big, the big difference between a biography and that documentary, because it could be a biography about him, yeah. is that he really... Especially when his wife came into the documentary and was sharing how he has changed during yeah. his life, right? That... Yeah. But, yeah. but, but I do think it's about the vulnerability that he shows and mm -hmm. the illness that he shows in the documentary, you know. Yeah. Uh, I think egos nowadays would, you know, someone could be quite careful about doing that. But he really shares his, his story in, in a very vulnerable way, you know. He, he, so I like that. I, I like that about the documentary that you have, yes, his wife telling, you know, that he was an asshole. And, yeah, know, that was a nice part. Yeah. Yeah. Like, he's, he's an yeah. asshole, but now he's better, you know. And, he is better, yes. So nice to me and the family to have him now, you know, because before he was a total, he was a total prick. Yeah. A human being. So, you know, I, I, I was engaged with the documentary. I think it's well done. And the stories that are told are very important. They, they do pick up um, a lot of different um, uh, institutions uh, that are also working on trauma, like the, the restorative circles, for example. And I do think that that film, plus all the talks. Yeah. 
made after the film is very powerful because uh, it's it's like um, yeah, it's like a, a, how do you say that a, a jazz adjacent? I, I don't know the word. Like it's just a plus, you know. Like yeah. you have DVD. it's extra flavors too. Because that's what I missed in the documentary. I thought it was. I, I, I didn't see enough cultures. So this is a topic that covers the whole world. And the only thing you've seen, and I'm, I'm a photographer, so I, I really look at images and what I see. And for me, I only saw his world where this is a, a thing that, you know, touches all of us. So I would have wanted to see in the documentary, like the documentary I like so much, um, Oh God, it's about people playing music all over the world and it's combined into one documentary. What's that called again? Oh shit, I forgot. I will let you know. I was missing that. I wanted to have other cultures and trauma involved as well and not only in Canada or wherever he was. Right? Yeah, of course. But this was a movie about him, about his work. Yeah, and, yeah well, uh, I, I would have seen a him. A lot of addiction also. Course, yeah, because I want to. I wanted to see him traveling the world, right, a little bit. But of course, there's budget involved and and whatnot. So. There's a lot of things involved, and I don't think he travels so much anymore. That's one of the things I think in the film that he says that he stopped being a workaholic. Um, so, but I do think that it was really important that they did this this annexation. You know, this this plus of the talking with all these experts because. He's, he, he, his work is, is combined with all these people. Yeah. Obviously you don't see that so much in the documentary. It's all about him and his work and, and, and some uh, of the subjects of, uh, of his patients, for example. It shows you a small range, but then with the, with the talks, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful. It's fascinating. It's let's, fascinating. Yeah. Sophia, let's, let's share a lot of details about our conversation underneath this video, a link to the documentary that we just spoke about. But uh, is your documentary also available online? Uh, no, it's not. No? <laughs> well, I could, I could put it, uh, yeah, but it's so old. I, I, I'm a bit, uh, yeah, I, I, I could actually just put yes. it Yes, can you do that? Yeah, okay, I can do that. Let's do that, because I want to see your documentary. And I think a lot of people also now, after watching us and listening to us, want to see your documentary. So um, if you could share that, I would love that. Yeah. yeah? Put okay. it on YouTube or whatever platform you want, okay. and let's share that. Um, okay. Let's share as many information as possible about you, about nonviolent communication. Uh, where you are, how people can reach you, if they want to talk to you, if they have questions. Um, I want to thank you so much for this interesting yeah. interview conversation. Really yeah. fascinating. Um, so cool. And and I, I, I will never, you know, I have this lying here. Uh, these are my uh, color pencils and it's red, you yeah. know, it's red fabric. So anytime I see this, Every time I see this, I will remember what you, what you just have told me in your documentary about blind people. Yeah. That fascinates me, you know, that they can touch that and then they can feel this is red. And I find that really fascinating. And the things we tell ourselves, the story we tell ourselves based on our trauma, I think everybody has trauma. I, I don't think there are people in this world who don't have trauma. We all have trauma as a child. Every time, always something goes unexpectedly wrong or difficult or whatnot. Um, I think it's very important to talk about this. Um, thank uh, you. Just, just wanted to say that it's very important what Gabor Mate says, uh, which I think is beautiful, which is like trauma is not what happens to us. It's the story we make of what happened to us. And exactly. that's I think, the beauty of stories, you know, that they have yeah. so Power. They have the power to make us uh, uh, healthy and also the power to make us sick. So it's important to, to be aware of our own stories. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and if you tell yourself something, it better be a good story. 
right? Because you're saying it to yourself. So why not a positive and a good and a friendly story instead of a story of you're doing not a good job? And, and we all recognize that, that we're saying these very harsh things to ourselves. In mm. uh, nonviolent communication, we learn how to welcome everything. So a bad story, it's also, there is no bad or good stories. There's only stories. And everything that we are feeling, if we welcome it, and if we are aware that it's there to tell us something, then there's nothing to worry about. <laughs> anyway, I think this was a very nice story. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you so, you so much. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, Sophia. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.